All right, we are live. Everybody, this is Dr. Michael K from the Center for Functional Health, and I am so excited tonight. I get to interview Dr. Amato. She is an integrative psychiatrist. Dr. Amato, welcome to tonight. Thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to speak with us. So I am looking forward to learning all about how you went from this conventional psychiatry into integrative psychiatry. So if we can start and you can share some of your background, that would be great. Sure. Uh, so I was very traditionally trained. Uh, I attended medical school for four years and I knew pretty early on in medical school that psychiatry was the field that I wanted to go into. I was just fascinated with the brain. Um, I loved the relationships that I was able to form with patients. And so it really was a natural choice for me. And um, so following medical school, I did uh, three years of general psychiatry residency. Um, at a hospital in New York, and I followed that with a two-year child and adolescent psychiatry fellowship. And um, the traditional training really was comprised of a heavy emphasis on use of psychiatric medications um, and also the use of talk therapy. And so when I started in uh, practice about 12 years ago, that was really uh, those were really the tools that I relied on very heavily and saw a lot of good results with those for a lot of patients. But um, I went through a really challenging professional experience about six years ago when I lost my first patient to suicide. Mm -hmm. And that really made me reevaluate um, just what I was doing, how I was practicing. It made me think of all the other patients I was treating who were really struggling with finding relief from depression and anxiety and other mental health disorders, despite trying sometimes um, five or 10 different medications. And so I started looking into what else was out there that was on the cutting edge of psychiatry and brain health, and also really started looking into more of a functional medicine root cause approach to what was going on that was causing some of these mental health disorders and disrupting people's brain health. Excellent. So when we, there's so much depression now, there's so much anxiety now, and for the most part, people you know, are, are conditioned uh by the media by commercials you know so you have an issue just take a pill for it and right. i know sometimes they say it's easier to write a prescription than it is to treat a patient but in your setting you have the, the ability to do both pharmaceutical management and also talk therapy correct yes yes um and there certainly is a place for pharmaceutical management of some of, some of these conditions, especially when people are in a very severe, um, just a, a very severe depression uh, in the case of sometimes suicidal thoughts. Uh, there, there is certainly a place for the use of medications. But I just think it's so important to be thinking beyond that. And often the medications can help with stabilizing someone or improving their condition to a degree. But then my question is, how do we take people from that point of just stability or getting them to the point of being fine, but then helping them go beyond that and really achieve true mental wellness? Having the patient you know, commit suicide really you know, turn corners for you, you really start thinking differently. I know in, in my field, you know, it's someone's always asking about their muscle skeletal condition, always asking about their gut condition, mm -hmm. what they can do about it. And there's always a family member. So how do you draw the line being psychiatry and dealing with family members? And I'm sure certain family members went through certain conditions that you kind of had to, you know, give your two sets. Mm hmm yeah, and uh, you know the role of family is so critical when people are in um, a very compromised state with their mental health or brain health. It's often difficult for people to muster the energy, the motivation, even the cognitive focus to be able to implement big lifestyle changes. Um, you know, for some people who are depressed, they're not hardly leaving the house. They're not going to the grocery store to buy healthy food and prepare healthy food. Um, so it can be really important to have supportive family members that are going to be on the journey of healing with that person uh, to help them implement some of these things, because it can be really challenging when, when people are, are very down with depression or other conditions. Let's talk about depression and anxiety. And if you can talk about the differences between those, I know for a lot of my female clients, you know, they they have multiple pains. They complain of brain fog. Uh, they have widespread joint pain. They have gut pain. They often end up with their 
doctors and they get a prescription for an anti-anxiety med, or you must be depressed, or you're hormonal, or you're female. I mean, that I, I've been practicing over 30 years, and that story hasn't changed. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I mean, it's really sad. It's the same line. So can we talk a little bit about the difference between anxiety and depression? And if we can talk about if there's overlaps, and how do we recognize that? Right. There are certainly overlaps. Depression and anxiety often run hand in hand. So when we're talking about depression, common symptoms that run along with that include sleep disturbances, meaning either people have difficulties falling asleep or staying asleep, or they may feel like sleeping excessively. Uh, often they lose, lose interest in the things that they usually enjoy, um, lose motivation to do things. They may have feelings of excessive guilt or worthlessness or hopelessness about the future. Fatigue is very common. Um, most people who are depressed report just having very low energy levels. And then problems with focus and concentration, like you mentioned, either brain fog, or I also see where people just really struggle with being able to make decisions. Um, anxiety, again, runs commonly with depression. There can be appetite disturbances where people either uh, don't feel hungry, food doesn't sound uh, appealing to them, or some people eat excessively. And then um, one of the more, more serious symptoms of uh, depression can be suicidal thoughts. Now, we have more kids who have you know, suicidal ideation. We have more kids now who are depressed. And and more people in general, especially through you know what's going on with the pandemic, right? To say you know you just need to you know hold your chin up and muscle through it isn't always the answer, and that's almost it's almost personally offensive, you know. And I don't think sometimes people see that. You know, I think it's not friends and relatives. You know, they want to say something good, but you know you, you can't just you know muscle through that, right? You don't necessarily muscle through a gut pain, muscle through uh, a back pain, and why would you muscle through a mental condition? Right. I mean, for many years, there's been a tremendous amount of stigma associated with mental health conditions or seeking mental health treatment. And I do think one of the positive things to come out of the experiences of the last year is I do feel like the dialogue about mental health and how important that is, that that has really come up so much more because uh, even people who weren't struggling with depression or anxiety before with all of the social isolation that's gone on, uh, just the increased stress of the different roles people have had to take on or um, the financial stress that people have been dealing with. Um, it's been in the dialogue more and I think that that's so important. And another aspect of what we've learned in the last year is with, uh, with COVID, there are certainly neuropsychiatric symptoms that people suffer from when they have that. And then we're seeing that too with the long hauler syndrome, where things like brain fog and even increase or new onset of depression, anxiety, PTSD, we're seeing all of these sorts of things. So, um, so I'm, I am glad that there's more of an open dialogue about how it is important to be thinking of our mental health during this year. And as, as parents, what can parents look for in their children that is their, you know, their warning sign that, you know what, my kid needs some real help? What can they look for? Well, certainly look for mood changes. And with kids, it's not always sadness and tears that indicate depression. Sometimes it's increased irritability and mood swings that can uh, be a signal that something's happening with their mood. But just like I listed off before that list of common symptoms, I had said um, one thing that's common can be losing interest in things or just not seeming to get pleasure. So if you see that your kids are kind of withdrawing, they're not liking to do activities that they usually do, that they're not engaging with their friends or engaging with the family in the same way, that's important to be looking at, as well as the sleep disturbances. Um, all of that is really important. and. One thing I really want the audience to know is if they have concerns that someone is suffering from depression or anxiety or even suicidal thoughts, don't be afraid to ask people those questions. And when it comes to suicide, even asking someone, are you having any kinds of thoughts about uh, persistent thoughts about death or, or do you ever think about taking your own life? It's important to ask those questions and it does not raise the likelihood that someone would actually go out and do that just because you asked the question. Gotcha. So what do we say or what do you say 
to the you know 40 year old woman who is taking on everything they're working many hours they're taking care of the kids they're exercising and they're doing so much they have un don't have any time for themselves and their anxiety keeps increasing and on the flip side we have the men who are men right and we're going to muscle in and we're just going to keep going keep our head down and how what do you say to them differently to have them basically open their eyes so they understand that there is an issue and there is a way to move forward. Well, um, I often will try to say to that person, you're really doing a good job with everything that you've got on your plate, everything that's expected of you. With what's happened in the last year, women have really disproportionately borne the brunt of the stressors and the disruption that's gone on with things like having to do online school from home, all the crazy childcare disruptions that have happened because of the pandemic, uh, people trying to work from home while kids are there. Uh, it's just, it's been so much for women in particular to take on. And um, so, so just letting women know that it's understandable that you're really struggling right now with everything that you're taking on. And then to explain the role that um, excessive stress can play, uh, whether it's uh, talking about their mental health, uh, talking about their physical health, hormonal disruption, and really just trying to give kind of a 360 degree view of, um, of what's happening with their mental health in terms of biologically, um, socially, um, psychologically, even spiritually, all those different dimensions that can um, culminate in what people experience as depression or anxiety symptoms. There's so much yes. to into that. So when a, a patient comes in with all of those, it's not only overwhelming for the physician, it's overwhelming for the patient. So hormones play a large role. And a lot of times, again, back to the female patient, well, you're just hormonal. And, and it, it, again, that that's personally offensive, but I'm still hearing those kind of replies. So what do you do? How do you differentiate? Like, okay, we're going to go down the hormonal route. We're going to look at that. Or, you know, the, the anxiety and depression is caused by the hormone. Or, you know, it's a combination of both. How do you mm -hmm. determine that? Um, well, I try to I try to explain how those different things could be contributing to what's going on. And one of the first things I like to do is to run some testing uh, because I don't like to make guesses. I like to have objective data. So um, whether it's starting with a comprehensive lab panel that they can have drawn locally or whether it's then moving on and doing some more advanced testing where maybe we're looking at gut health or maybe we're looking at um, salivary hormones or things like that. Um, I try to just present uh, a roadmap, if you will, of, you know, we're going to start here. We're going to try these things initially, but this is the plan of where we're going. And you can't, you can't solve everything all at once. As much as we all want immediate relief and we want everything all at once, it, it just doesn't happen that way, especially when people have complex mental health, and usually there are physical symptoms um, tied into that as well. So um, what I really try to do from the beginning, though, is to instill hope and to let people know we're on this journey together and we're going to figure this out. You know, we'll start with this intervention here. We'll start with this test. But we've got a whole plan here of, of various things we can do because it's so important for people to have hope mm -hmm. and uh, to have kind of that, that increase motivation and energy if they feel like they've been heard and if they feel like there are some answers that could be on the way. So let's talk a little bit about the causes of anxiety and depression that it's just not all in the brain that there are many reasons. There could be underlying uh, infections, bacterial infections, it could be mold, Lyme. Um, you've had experiences with that uh, personally as well, right? So let's talk a little bit about, you know, what could be driving factors that are often overlooked for you know, anxiety and depression. Right, so you know, starting with the traditional approach, there's been so much emphasis on uh, neurochemicals, uh, neurotransmitter balance as being the, uh, the cause and then the solution of how to help people feel better in terms of their mental health, but that often really does fall short or it may provide just more immediate short-term relief. But beyond that, um, there's so much to be said for the gut-brain connection. And I think a lot of people don't realize that things like 
food sensitivities, particularly gluten and dairy for some people, um, can cause some significant issues with anxiety, insomnia, um, beyond just even the gut issues, skin issues, um, physical symptoms that they can cause. And um, so it is really important to think about food sensitivities or think about the health of the gut microbiome because we also know with the microbiome, there are certain gut bacteria that are very involved in um, the, the mood and brain health. And um, so really looking at those factors can, can play a big role in brain health. Okay, let's break it down a little bit more and go into the microbiome. You know, this 100 to 300 trillion kind of microbes <laughs> in our gut. I mean, people hear about microbiome. They're not always sure what it is. And yet, here we're talking about how the microbiome, the gut, can play a role in our mental outlook. So mm -hmm. what have you seen in practice and what tests do you like to use to say, wow, I found this. This is definitely contributing to the anxiety or depression. And this is how we're going to treat. When I always tell people, listen, the, the illness the system itself is, is actual condition that's leading to stress and your depression and anxiety. So we can get that under control, then you can feel better. So what do you see on your test? What kind of test do you like to use when you're looking at that kind of you know gut type of testing? So one test I commonly use is from a company called Genova. It's called the GI effects test. And so it's looking at different markers that can indicate uh, the balance of the gut microbiome, the diversity of that. Um, also looking for um, indicators of inflammation or infection. And so that test can be really helpful to give us an idea of where to even start with where there may be some problems with, um, with gut health. And it gives, it usually gives some very helpful feedback in terms of interventions that could be used based off the testing results. And so I commonly will use uh, probiotics. Um, el eliminating certain foods can be a really big part of helping with gut health. And uh, if there are certain infections that need to be treated, we can address that as well. And, it, and just like I was saying before, as much as we want to have quick fixes and dive in and do everything all at once. Even just taking that one test alone and talking about gut health, it it can take quite a while to make all of the interventions that you have planned and and see and see some of those results. So, in your history of treating patients, have you seen more so it's gluten that's creating most of the problem? Is it more so additives? What are you seeing in your practice that you know, it seems like every time we get rid of X, they always feel a little bit better. <laughs> um, you know, I would say gluten's a really big one um, for certain patients, especially if they also, in addition to their mental health problems, have some GI problems going on. Um, I've had patients with um, IBS, um, colitis, GERD, that when we make some interventions to, um, to, help their gut health, it really does help their sleep and it helps uh, their level of anxiety, sometimes to the point where they're able to reduce their psychiatric medication. So that that alone, the gluten can be a really powerful elimination. Um, but sugar and uh, food additives, and when people switch over to more of a whole foods based diet and they really get away from the processed foods that you find in the middle of the store, um, often that alone helps tremendously with their energy levels and their clarity of thinking. Excellent. So when you talk about a little bit about vitamin supplements, a lot of people take vitamin supplements, not always the right ones, um, always sometimes too much, too little, not the right ones. But sometimes there's also contraindication taken with certain anti-anxieties and antidepressants. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people want to, you know, run out and get some St. John's wort and they don't, you know, we're going to use some 5-HTP mm -hmm. and they think that's okay and it shouldn't really affect our medication. So can you talk a little bit about what vitamins or supplements you may want to avoid when you're on certain SSRIs or SSNIs, stuff like that? Yeah, well, you mentioned really two of the big ones, um, St. John's wort. Um, is one that if people are on an antidepressant, they should probably avoid the use of that. And again, 5-HTP and L-tryptophan may be some to avoid, um, possibly L-tyrosine too, just because of, of possible interactions. Right. And then they run out and they get it and 
but some, sometimes that actually backfires on them. Um, or they're not getting the right ones for the right condition. So, you know, we'll see patients that come to the office, for example, that have underlying Lyme. And I don't think a lot of people realize unless they get Lyme that, you know, it's more than just a tick and you get, you get a muscle ache or something like that, that it can actually affect the brain. Right. So can you tell a little bit how that can affect the brain, how Lyme can affect the brain? Yeah, so uh, so there are neuro neuropsychiatric manifestations of Lyme, and sometimes those are the only symptoms of Lyme uh, that people experience. So it could be depression that's not responding to um, interventions. It could be anxiety. Uh, sometimes it's new onset anxiety where someone's never had issues with anxiety before, and then all of a sudden they're having panic attacks and. Um, and then often it's uh, cognitive issues to where people are having problems with their memory. And uh, there was a really uh, interesting case uh, in terms of a celebrity who who had um, who had been diagnosed with cognitive decline, Chris Christopherson. And he, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And then upon further investigation, they found that he actually had Lyme disease. And when they treated that, his cognitive functioning improved tremendously. So I think it's a condition that's often overlooked. Um, I think some of that is changing because there is just more dialogue about that possibly being in the differential to consider when someone is dealing with a treatment resistant condition or cognitive decline. When you're talking about cognitive decline, can you talk a little bit about the difference between, oh, I can't remember where my keys are, to like, I'm actually forgetting names of people in the past or I'm forgetting current names. Can you talk about that that difference of, when is it like the uh-oh factor? Like, I, I gotta get this checked out or we gotta get mom checked out. Well, a lot of people start to experience what's called subjective cognitive decline. Um, it might be in their 40s or early 50s where they can just tell their, their memory is not what it used to be. Um, for women, I find this to be the case when they're going through perimenopause or into menopause and with the loss of estrogen, um, often women have more trouble with memory. So it might be things like having difficulty finding a particular word or name, but really the time to intervene, maybe not to, to go to the point of seeing a neurologist or worrying about an Alzheimer's diagnosis, but really if people are noticing a decline in their focus, their concentration, their memory, uh, whether it's in their 30s or their 40s, the time to sh to have some concern about that is now. And there are things that people can do, again, with lifestyle interventions, with changing diet uh, that can help tremendously with those early memory changes. And I like to educate people about how diabetes, um, how Alzheimer's is now being referred to as type 3 diabetes because we know that disruptions with blood sugar regulation can contribute to the later manifestation in life of Alzheimer's disease. But often the changes that are taking place that are affecting the brain are happening decades, two to three decades before people actually manifest with Alzheimer's symptoms. So we need to be a lot more mindful about our brain health, even in our thirties and forties. What kind of test do you like to run as a baseline? You know, for example, you know, we, you know, somebody comes in the office and I do a lot of cardiometabolic, so I like to run the NMR lipo profile and get a baseline and dig really deep into like an apolipo B and a little lipoprotein little A and all that kind of stuff. What do you like to use as a baseline? And should we, is this something we should get when we're 20, when we're 30 to get that baseline? You know, I think probably one of the most critical, some of the most critical labs people can get in their 20s or 30s that may reflect risk uh, for dementia later in life are um, some of the tests that look at blood sugar. So a fasting blood glucose, a fasting insulin, a hemoglobin A1C, um, it, some of the genetic testing that you mentioned can be helpful, especially if people have a history of Alzheimer's disease and they want to know maybe what the risk is for them. But um, but I think making just general lifestyle changes earlier in life where people are more mindful of not only waiting for type 2 diabetes as an official diagnosis, but recognizing that years before being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, people are going through a process of what's called insulin resistance. And when you go into your primary care doctor and you get a basic uh, lab panel run where they're looking at uh, blood glucose and hemoglobin A1C, often they'll tell you you're fine 
and that your labs are within the reference range. But the problem is, is they may not be in the optimal range. The reference range is just a range of normal um, or average, I should say average, but it's not optimal. So we really need to become more educated about how to read those labs so that we're making better choices um, earlier. That's fantastic. So do you like to look at the APOE4 gene? I know I always look at, you know, these, these genes and I, and I think before I share with a patient, I do take into consideration, are, are these the type of individuals that if it does come back positive, that I'm going to set them on a course of constant worry and worsen their anxiety? Um, right. And do you ever have experience with that where it's like, you know, something came back, it's like, oh my God, I have it. And now they're just worried all the time. And maybe they forget where they put your keys and they're, oh my God, this is the beginning. Right. And I don't, I don't run that particular test very commonly. If someone were to ask me to run it, um, I would explore a little more with them. Why do you want to run this? How are you going to feel if it comes back in a certain way? Or how willing would you be, be to make some changes to help decrease your risk if it comes back in that high risk category? Um, I think my focus is more just on talking to people very generally about uh, these these different lifestyle and nutritional changes that they can make that are going to benefit them, uh, regardless of what those genetic tests show, because it's important for people to realize that, um, you know, they talk about how genetics um, load the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. And so genetics is not everything. There's so much we can do with lifestyle to, to change the course of whatever our genetic risk might be. Um, knowing the genetics is sometimes helpful to know what our trip wires are and to know what to be on the lookout for. Um, but by implementing some of these basic uh, nutritional and lifestyle changes, they're going to benefit across the, the board, whether it's brain health or cardiovascular health. Um, all of that is important to keep in mind. Fantastic. <laughs> you know, what could be some causes the, that you could use some medication, you can use some supplements, that lifestyle intervention is really important, that food changes are really important as well. Can we talk a little bit about actual treatment? Because, you know, when you think about psychiatry, a lot of my patients are still thinking psychiatry of like 30 years ago, where they're going to do, a, you know, electroshock therapy and all that kind of stuff. And you and I briefly talked that, you know, there actually is a role for that. And what I find interesting and I want to learn about tonight is that transcranial magnetic stimulation that you do. I, I find that absolutely interesting. So if we can look at what that is and how you use it um, and share with our listeners about that and, and what do they need to have or present with that the psychiatrist would say, yes, this is what we want to do. And I want to make sure the only one that really does this is the psychiatrist, correct? Uh, correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so after that experience of losing a patient six years ago, there were two treatments that I incorporated into my practice that following year. And one was TMS, uh, which stands for transcranial magnetic stimulation. And the other was IV ketamine infusions. And so TMS is, um, it's a therapy that was FDA cleared in 2008, uh, primarily for treatment resistant depression. And uh, since 2008, there have been a couple of other indications that have come about. One is for OCD. And then very recently, one of the TMS devices was approved for smoking cessation. So, um, but I'll speak to the depression protocol more so than the others, just because that's really where I've emphasized my practice more. But TMS is is generally used when people have not responded adequately to um, at least usually four medications is what insurance companies want to see to cover this treatment. And it works by delivering MRI strength magnetic pulses over an area of the brain that's been identified as being slowed or sluggish when people are suffering from depression. And the treatments themselves, um, they can range, depending on the protocol that's used, they can range from about five minutes up to 18 minutes in length. Uh, there's no anesthesia required. So you mentioned shock therapy or ECT. Um, so with ECT, there is anesthesia that's required with that. But with TMS, 
people are able to drive over from work or school and get their treatment and resume, resume their daily activities. And it's a treatment course that goes on for about six to nine weeks. And uh, what we see is about a 70% response, or even within that category of response, we see about 25% of people in remission by the end of that treatment. So that means that um, if their depression is in remission, they're really not exhibiting symptoms of depression any longer. So it, it can be a very effective treatment for people who haven't responded to medications or those who haven't been able to tolerate medications too, because um, there can be some debilitating side effects, whether it's um, nausea or uh, sexual dysfunction or a lot of other symptoms that can be very troubling. But you have to go through the med first before you can get this? Typically, yes. Unless people, um, if people want insurance to cover it, and it and it is a quite an expensive treatment because we're talking about six to nine weeks of treatment. Um, so generally it's four medications. Some insurances in the last year or so have reduced that to two medications before people can get the treatment. Uh, but it is generally well tolerated. The main side effect we see is uh, headaches, but that's often within the first week of treatment when the brain is getting used to that level of stimulation. Um, and even with headaches being common, we treat a lot of migraine sufferers who have depression and are getting TMS. And some of them even report that their migraines improve with the treatment. So we just, we see a lot of benefit with it. And it's been a wonderful treatment to be able to offer to people who still aren't getting relief from the more traditional interventions. It just seems so counterproductive that we have to give medication first when this outcome seems so wonderful. Um, it's, it's kind of sad. I mean, I, you know, we all see that in the insurance world, but I sure mm -hmm. wish it was, it was flipped. You know, that would, that would be nice. So, you know, when, if you, if, when we talk about in, in my practice, we have a lot of chronic pain patients. Mm -hmm. um, and would you use something in like, like this in that setting? Could that help them? There are some uh, either studies that have been done or there may be some practices that are doing some chronic pain protocols with TMS that would be considered off label. Um, I don't have as much experience with that within my practice. But one thing that we've seen too is as people's depression improves, again, often they're able to do other health promoting activities that were difficult for them when they had low energy, when they had low motiv motivation. So um, I always talk to people about trying to incorporate exercise into their routine because exercise is so amazing for mood. And so when people are, are responding to TMS and their depression is a bit better, often they're getting outside, they're more mobile, uh, they're working out. And so that's something that can be helpful for chronic pain, or it may get them to the point where it's, it's uh, a conversation about, hey, your mood is better, you're more energetic, are you feeling ready now to implement some, some dietary changes? And sometimes those can help with decreasing inflammation, which then decreases pain as well. And, and we've seen some great outcomes with um, when people have been able to make some eliminations and especially getting sugar out of the diet. Some of our patients that were regularly reaching for ibuprofen on, on a daily basis, have reported that those general aches and pains have improved and they're able to walk further distances. So. That's interesting. With the transcranial magnetic stimulation, what are you seeing as the physician? Like when you hook them up to this MRI, you said, right? It's, it's like, a, like a magnetic way that you're receiving Mag magnetic, I guess, correct? So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's you, a coil. Um, it's a, either what's called a figure eight coil, or there's a device where the coil is, is within a helmet. So it's a, it's a more compact sort of setup than thinking about a, going into an MRI. Okay. And then is, is this way where you do like a, you look at a functional, M, M, functional MRI like pre and post, so you can actually see changes in the brain? So in clinical practice, we're not there with that sort of technology uh, quite yet. That's something that is done commonly within university settings where they may be doing studies on TMS. Um, but what we do at the beginning of TMS is we use certain measurements and markers to locate the right treatment spot for the patients. And then um, that's basically the spot we come back to every day um, to, to deliver that treatment. I'm fascinated. When you get to that point, when you go to the, back to the specific spots, 
Are you saying that these specific spots are now better and then so we don't need to do that specific spot anymore? Or is that based off of like their subjective complaint? How do, how do you go back to that specific one versus another one? So, so the spot is based on certain anatomical markers and measurements that we use to determine where to set the treatment coil. And it's, it's very specific. Um, it, it, it differs to a degree from patient to patient just because of their differing anatomy. People have different head sizes and, and, and things of that nature. Um, but it is very specific as far as uh, you know, the measurements that we use to locate the right treatment spot. Absolutely interesting. I found that fascinating. Is, is there anywhere that any that patients can you know look at this? Is there anywhere? Do you have anything on your site or up on YouTube or anything where they can look for this kind of treatment? Sure. So the practice um, where I do TMS is called Montana Psychiatry and Brain Health Center. So my website is mtpsychiatry.com. So people can see some information there about TMS. Um, and, and they could also just, if they're interested in this treatment in the area where they live, they could Google TMS or TMS in my area. And, um, and there would be other practices. Um, there would be practices in that region that you could look at their information. That's fantastic. <laughs> about another treatment protocol and that's the use of ketamine. Mm -hmm. So ketamine is growing. It's by, it, you know, it's, 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 it, which is good because patients are getting an excellent outcome with that. Can you talk about ketamine? Yeah, I mean, ketamine has been one of the most exciting things that I've added to my practice along with TMS, but um, it's being called a breakthrough treatment by a lot of people because when it works for people, it can be pretty amazing and it works so much faster than doing a medication trial and sometimes waiting weeks or months and, and having to adjust dose over the period of weeks or months. And so, um, I've done primarily IV ketamine treatments in my practice. Uh, there are different different delivery methods, though. Um, sometimes it's given by an intramuscular injection. Um, there's a new a newer form of ketamine. It's a derivative of ketamine called S-ketamine uh, that's marketed under the name Spravato, and it's an intranasal ketamine treatment. And I've just started doing that in my practice within the last month, and we're seeing some great outcomes with that. And so, um, but with the IV ketamine, the, the protocol that we've implemented is that we do two IV treatments for three weeks. So a total of six treatments over that course of three weeks. And then when people have responded to ketamine, there's usually a need to return at some point in the future for some periodic booster or maintenance treatments. So it's different for everyone. We have some patients that can just tell that that their marker of needing a booster treatment is around three months, or some people need it more frequently, where it's more like a monthly treatment they need. But we really do see some amazing outcomes with that. And I would say it's around 70 to 80% that respond to ketamine. So just like with TMS, I mean, TMS about 70%, ketamine about 70 to 80%, there are still people within uh, those groups that aren't responding to ketamine or to TMS, but it's been very nice within our clinic that if we start with one and someone isn't seeing the level of response that they need, that we're able to then offer another treatment that we can move them on to. So and that's part of that conversation I try to have with people at the beginning to say, hey, here's the plan and I want you to have hope because we have these great treatments available. And even if these don't work for you, there are always new things that we're learning about the brain and about mood. And so there's always reason to have hope and to hang on. And the, stress and the ketamine, is that more for the depression versus the anxiety? I know, again, it can be blended, but do you use it more towards that person suffering with depression? Yes, we see better outcomes when the primary complaint is depression. Uh, but usually when the depression improves, the anxiety does improve along with it. Uh, we also see it being useful, useful for a lot of people with PTSD. And um, just, like I, just like we've talked about the importance of an integrative approach and, and looking at multiple factors in terms of what can help someone get well, I have that conversation with people too about ketamine and TMS that these are just one slice of the treatment pie. And along with this, we need to look at things like nutritional changes or exercise 
or mindfulness and meditation practices. That's a really big one that I talk to people about when they're going through ketamine treatment. And the role of talk therapy too. With ketamine, that's very important that people are working with a therapist who can help them um, to be able to integrate and process some of the things that might come up for them with that therapy. So a lot of people are scary. So it, it's under your supervision. I mean, it's, I'm sure things must come up and they have to be addressed. Does anybody come out of it like, yeah, I don't want to do this again? It happens very rarely. I mean, I would say 97% of the time, the experience is, is very relaxing, um, pleasurable, interesting. But there are some people that have some pretty serious anxiety, panic, agitation with the ketamine. And often it's patients who maybe have some unresolved trauma, maybe a history of abuse that they haven't really dealt with. So again, that's why it's really important for people to be working with a therapist and doing talk therapy in between the time that they do their ketamine treatments. And sometimes I'll evaluate someone and if they have that really heavy trauma history and if I don't feel like they've really dealt with it, I might say, hey, let's start with talk therapy first. Um, and often it's therapies like uh, EMDR is one that's quite popular now with helping people with a trauma history. But let's start with therapy first to really get you more prepared and then maybe use ketamine down the road uh, to help take their healing even further. Okay, so can you hear me? It's, it's a little bit, it's a little oh, bit okay. off. Okay, so let's see if this works. A little bit better back here? Yes. All right, so the question is, do these treatments work for bipolar depression or borderline personality? So um, I do use ketamine to treat people with bipolar depression. Um, I will only treat people if they're in the depressive phase of that illness. It's important not to treat people with ketamine if they're in the midst of a manic phase. TMS is only approved, when we're talking about depression, it's only approved for major depressive disorder, MDD. It's not approved, um, FDA approved for treatment of bipolar depression at this time. Um, as far as borderline personality disorder, that's really something I determine on a case-by-case -case basis, um, in part because often when people have borderline personality disorder, it may be linked with a trauma history, um, early childhood of abuse, things like that. And so I just really need to determine on a case-by-case -case basis if I feel like someone um, is, is ready for the ketamine treatments and will tolerate that. And for bipolar? What was that? And the people who suffer with bipolar, what do uh, you do for them? Um, bipolar depression, I, I do use ketamine to help um, to help with the, that. The the newer, um, the FDA approved derivative of ketamine, the S-ketamine or Spravato, uh, that is not approved for use for bipolar depression at this time. It's only approved in cases of major depressive disorder where people have uh, not responded to at least two or more medications or in cases where people have major depressive disorder and maybe they haven't tried two or more medications, but they are suffering from suicidal thoughts. Those are the two indications. And what about contracts on LDN? Yeah, so I use LDN um, in patients who have autoimmune disorders, or if it seems like there's a strong inflammatory component to what's uh, to what's going on for them. I've used it in some patients who have migraines and have seen good results with it. Excellent. And what are your thoughts on, you know, everybody is CBD crazy now, you know, mm -hmm. CBD and everything now. So um, what role do you feel CBD or medical cannabis plays in the treatment of anxiety and depression? Well, I think CBD can be used effectively in um, certain cases of anxiety. There are some studies, some very reputable studies out there to support that. But I tell my patients I am very picky about brands and very picky about quality of CBD because it's the Wild West right now. Mm -hmm. And so you have brands out there that are uh, claiming that they have a certain amount of CBD or they don't have a certain amount of THC. And when these have been studied by independent uh, parties that it just hasn't been the case. 
And so um, I, I tell my patients if they're going to try CBD, I want them to be using hemp derived CBD and not be using uh, cannabis. I don't want them to be using THC necessarily. So, um, so I do think it can be used. I, I, I've seen some patients though, who have had a worsening of their anxiety um, if they start out at the doses that may be recommended on the bottle. So my philosophy with everything, medication, CBD, whatever it might be is start low, go slow. And so I'll have people start at a, at a low level, see how they tolerate it and then increase it if needed. Excellent. As we wind up, um, my listen, we've been through a hell of a year, two years now. I think it just is all blending into 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 one, actually. So what can you leave us with? You know, what positive direction can we take mentally, emotionally coming out of this pandemic that we are still living in? I think one of the lessons of this more than a year now has been the importance of starting now on improving our overall health, both our physical and our mental health, and really thinking about conditions like um, obesity and diabetes, and uh, for people who suffer from mental health conditions, depression and anxiety, learning some healthy coping skills can be so important. And the other lesson of this year, I think, is how much we need each other, how much we really need social connection and to look out for each other. And so um, I know things are starting to open up and now some people are feeling weird about uh, how do I put myself back out there socially after I've been away from people for so long. But I think that has been a huge lesson is the importance of connection and real connection too. Here we are, we're all so hyper-connected on, on platforms like Facebook or Instagram to where you know these weird details about people that you went to high school with or some remote person. You may know some of these minute details about where they went on vacation or their kids started school last week. But there was an epidemic of loneliness in this country even before the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. And there's such a consequence of loneliness on our mental health, but our long-term physical health as well. So really thinking about how to deepen our connections and really appreciate the relationships that we have is so important. That's beautiful. You know, I, I say you know, there's still great power in hugs. Yeah. It, it really is. And I had a, an elderly lady who did really well and, you know, she was leaving and, you know, discharging her from care. And she like leans in, she whispers, can I hug you? And I'm like, of course you can. And she's like, nobody's hugged me in a long time. And, you know, and we forget about the, the human touch. Yeah. Right? The human mm -hmm. touch plays such a strong role. You know, it's really important. And she was so thrilled. You know, she's so happy. She was so grateful for something that we took for granted before. Absolutely. And it was a hug. Yeah. You no, know, just a hug. So how can people get in touch with you? Uh, people can find me on Facebook and Instagram, Erin Amato, MD. Uh, I'll be making some announcements over the next few weeks and months about some exciting things I have planned with some group programs I'm developing and some online courses. So I would love to have people follow and, and have people from all around the country involved in, in what we're doing. Uh, it's wonderful. Thank you again tonight. When that's, all that stuff is ready, you let me know and I'll share it with everybody as well. And you know what? I look forward to speaking with you again. So thank you very much for joining with us tonight. Yeah, thank you. Have a great evening. You too. Hang in there one sec.